Hello, and welcome to Pure to Spring Software's 53rd Frequently Asked Question video. I'm Ernie Zor, and in this video I'll follow up on FAQ 52, and I'm going to go through some of the details about the will I drafted in that video using our Deed and Document Pro software. And although the software is convenient, you didn't need the software to follow FAQ 52, and likewise, you don't need Deed Pro to follow this video. In fact, I won't even use Deed and Document Pro in this video. Instead, I'm using Word, basically, and, and I've loaded the will that I created there. I'm, it's what you see on the screen right now. So let's start going through this in a little more detail than I did in uh, FAQ 52. Uh, the first paragraph of the will, which I got on the screen right now, identifies the person making the will. We call him the testator or testatrix if it's a female. To keep, them, to, to keep things simple, I've assumed when I made FAQ 52 that the person making the will was a male. Uh, note that if the testator had additional names or nicknames under which he owned assets, you'd want to include the other names as AKAs, also known as, to avoid ownership issues when the time comes. It's good practice. Uh, not absolutely critical. So in other words, if it, if it was Joseph Testator and, and, and he had a perha perhaps a professional name of... Um, uh, Joe Smith or something, uh, you'd want to put Joseph Testator, a.k.a. Joe Sm Smith. And you want to do that, I think we called it the party ID dialog or the party ID button that brought it up. And you can put all that in there and then it'll show up that way. Oh, also, for, fe for females, maiden names might be a consideration in that regard, like an a.k.a. I think they use FKA, formerly known as for that. Sometimes people ask about using the full address of the testator because you'll notice I just put in here Township of Hinckley County and Medina. Not good to put the full address in there. Today's testators, they move, they change residences since the making of the will. That could be 10 years prior to their death. Therefore, it's best to leave the specific address of the testator out. So that's enough talk about the first paragraph. That's all it does is identify the testator. So let's take a look at item number one. It's about specific bequests. And that's what we have in item number one. These are bequests of particular items. And here I entered a grand piano. The thing to consider here is what happens if the beneficiary predeceases the testator. Uh, that would be called a contingent beneficiary. In this instance, uh, Ohio law presumes a per sterpes arrangement if you don't specify differently and that means that the bequest will pass in equal shares to the beneficiary's children if there are any surviving the beneficiary. That's what's meant by per sterpes and by per capita that means that if there are several children the deceased beneficiary's share would then go to the surviving children and nothing would go to the predeceased child. So in other words, if the testator had, or if the beneficiary had three children and one of them predeceased, then the two remaining living children would split the estate 50-50 and it would, nothing would go to that third child's children if in fact that third child had any. Now alternatively, you can use the name, you can name a contingent beneficiary. I didn't do that in this case, uh, instead, I used the per sterpes method, like I said. But in other words, you could, you, it would say, um, should so-and-so fail to survive me, then I, I give and bequeath this grand piano to, and then you name somebody else. And that's the contingent beneficiary, which, again, I didn't do that here. The next thing I want to talk about is when you give away specific items like the grand piano, what happens is the, the estate, you can kind of think of it in two parts. Whatever is specifically given away, and whatever's left, everything, whatever's left is called the residuary estate. In wills with no specific bequests, you, the, the residuary estate is the entire estate. In many or most cases, the beneficiary of the residuary estate is the spouse, if there is one. And in this instance, there was. There was a wife named Sarah. And this is what you see happening. I'll scroll up a bit. 
in item number two. This is the, that residuary clause, and it disposes of the, the residuary estate to the wife, Sarah. thought I had a contingent beneficiary for item two. I don't see one. Okay, well, there's no contingent beneficiary. I thought I named the son, and I'm, I'm wondering if I, uh, I, I've got a correct copy of the will, but it doesn't matter. It, it would be as I said. And so let's go on to item number three. That's the executor clause. I'll bring it up here. Uh, this is usually the longest paragraph in the will. It names the executor, or if it's a, a, a female, it's, the term is executrix. The, the executor takes the will into court and proves that the provisions of the will are being followed and that the debts of the estate are paid. In this case, uh, it's, we're, we're using the term executrix because the surviving spouse, Sarah, is, is the person filling the capacity of uh, fiduciary for the estate, the executrix. And also, uh, you want to choose an, an alternate executor, and that, uh, that happens if the person that you chose to be the executor or executrix is, uh, doesn't want to be, or they fail to qualify, or they're predeceased. Let's take a look at the executor clause in more detail. First of all, bonds can be expensive. And if there's only a sole beneficiary, for example, there's probably no need for one. Therefore, it's common for a simple will, the, for the executor clause, to dispense with the bond. And that's what you see happening here in that, in that first sentence. If you wanted to know what the bond was about, it's, the bond assures the good faith of the executor. I think the rule is to make the executor get a bond when in doubt. Item 3 also grants the executor or executrix powers to manage or sell the estate assets. And that's what you see down here in very broad language that covers just about any kind of property and any kind of asset, uh, just dealing with the, the estate in any way that the executor sees fit thing I wanted to say about the executor clause is that there are laws requiring the appointment of an appraiser for household goods and furniture. And there are many instances where that's unnecessary. For example, a will that's going to a sole beneficiary. The language of item three dispenses with that requirement. Now, if you've got uh, siblings and they don't get along, that's an instance where you might want to uh, require a bond on behalf of the executor or executrix witnesses. Okay, finally, the witness clause ensures the signature requirements are observed. Each page should be signed or initialed at the bottom so that pages can't be easily replaced. On a related note, you can see the blank line showing how many pages the will is. That's because we don't always know how long it's going to be, at least at the beginning, because there could be one specific bequest or ten of them uh, that'll make the will longer. So uh, sometimes we, we just, if we, if we know, we put it in there, and if we don't, we just leave a blank line so we could fill it in after we print it out. Uh, this will is, is pretty much complete, so I suppose we could have put in there. Uh, and that is also done for, ver for verification purposes, so a page can't be destroyed or added. In Ohio... The witness requirement is that there be two witnesses, and they must be present when the testator signs the will. There's an additional requirement. Also, the witnesses must sign in the presence of the testator, just like he signed in their presence. And in addition to that, they have to sign in the presence of each other. So both witnesses have to be there at the time. They both have to Everybody's got to sign in the presence of everybody else, and that is very important. Wills are defective when that is not followed to the letter of the rule. And I seem to even remember cases where one person signed and then they, maybe it was a law office or something, and they walked out of the room and then the other person signed while they were out answering a telephone call or whatever, and that it invalidated the will. Uh, so you want to keep that in mind. And finally, the witnesses, at least to the best of their ability, they're attesting to the fact that uh, the testator is of sound mind. And guess what? Looks like there's the um, things that I was just talking about. I should have scrolled it up a little quicker than I did. But you see there about the sound and disposing mind and uh, 
in the presence of each other. All those requirements are there. Sorry, I didn't scroll it up fast enough. But that does bring us to the end of the will. And so I hope you enjoyed this video. And, and if you did, I would like to take the time to remind you that if you found the video interesting, click the like button. You support our channel by doing that. And you let us know we're doing something worthwhile. If you think you'd like to know about upcoming videos, then click the subscribe button and you'll be notified when each new video is published. So in closing, hey, thank you for taking the time to watch. I sincerely appreciate it. And until next time, stay healthy and happy. I wish you all the best.